Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I just wanted to echo the thanks to the Center for Teaching and Learning for putting this on in the English department uh, and to Heather Love as well. Um, I'm going to um, confess, I have a little bit of a cold. I have at home two daughters in daycare. I work at a university with suck, un suck undergrads, and my wife works at a high school. So our house is a little bit of a petri dish sometimes. So, uh, But I've got, uh, Ben took me to get some hot tea with uh, lemon and honey. So I, I think my voice ought to, ought to hold throughout. Um, <clears throat> So uh, today, I'm going to be talking about genre theory and the aspirations of general education. And I'm actually going to start with the second half of that title first, uh, a little bit about the aspirations of general education. Uh, some of this will probably be pretty familiar. Um, there's no single thing that is general education, despite the name, right? Uh, general education is a lot of different things in a lot of different places. But in the broadest sense, we can follow the language that the American Association of Colleges and Universities uh, right. So they say that general ed education exposes students to multiple disciplines and forms the basis of developing essential intellectual, civic, and practical capacities. And I think we can point to two very broad versions of this uh, vision of general education. Um, the first one would be uh, the really familiar distributive model, right? So this is where students have to take X number of credits in the arts and humanities, X number of credits in the sciences, X number of credits in so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the, and then the other model is going to point more towards liberal learning principles. So these are going to be things like uh, uh, critical thinking or um, uh, quantitative literacy, ethical reasoning, civic mindedness, so on and so forth. And right off the bat, we could say these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive approaches. They often do overlap at a lot of different institutions. But I'm sure you all are familiar with this plight. General education programs, in part because of their very sort of institutional existence, can produce a tension, this tension between general education and disciplinary preparation. And just to bear out what does this tension look like, we can point to several different voices in my own field of writing studies. So for example, David Russell and Arturo Yanez write, on the one hand, students and teachers are pulled towards one disciplinary specialization. On the other hand, they're pulled towards general or broad education for civ civic life and uh, or other pro uh, professional specializations with alienation often resulting. That alienation being kind of the key problem because it's on both sides, right? That the students can feel alienated from the professors, but the professors can also feel alienated from their students and their students' goals and desires. Um, Chris Tayas puts it a little bit differently and maybe a little bit more uh, biased. Uh, he says, the goals of general education courses tend to be idealistic, e.g. cultural literacy, the ability to write in college, appreciation of the scientific method, whereas goals of, of major courses tend to be specific and pre-professional. I think that word idealistic kind of points to his, his bias towards the uh, professionalization uh, side of the spectrum. This distinction then ca can cause problems when it comes to writing as well. Uh, so Leanne Carroll writes, uh, within this uh, tension, the gap between students' ideas of normal ways of writing and the expectations of professor, professors uh, representing specialized academic disciplines may be especially large. So in other words, students may be coming into our general education courses with a broad definition of what good writing means, one that they've learned in high school and maybe in composition, uh, whereas professors are often coming with really discipline-specific understandings of good writing even if they're not entirely always aware that their expectations for writing are, are bound to their disciplines. <clears throat> so one way of trying to alleviate this tension through general education has been to turn to high impact educational practices as a third mode of general education. Um, these include things like first year experiences, which I gather you all have a first year experience program here, right? Um, capstone courses, I think yes. you have. Um, an essential studies program, that's their model of general education. Uh, and it's a hybrid model. It includes a distribution model, liberal learning principles, and high impact practices. So they do kind of all three uh, to serve all comers, so to speak. And within the essential studies program, capstone courses technically can be taken in any, de any department, although mostly students take them in their own major department nowadays. And they have to address two essential studies goals, like thinking reasoning, communication, information literacy, or diversity. And they also are designed to provide a culminating experience for most majors. So that's kind of the, the background of the course that I'm going to be talking about. <clears throat> and so in terms of high impact practices within the course, it focused heavily on uh, personal development and 
discipline of AI. And both of these are sort of key facets of high impact practice generally and capstone courses specifically. So uh, Professor Morrison took a really strong disciplinary perspective in the course. He really focused on helping students understand their discipline and the relationship between these kindred disciplines of political science and public administration. But despite this really heavy disciplinary focus, he also took an extra disciplinary perspective. He wanted students to be able to take their learning and think about how it was also related to uh, the institution, uh, public ways of communicating, and there were also sort of civic applications of the ways of knowing, doing, and writing that they had learned in political science and public administration. I'm going to talk a little bit about how civic participation was a latent goal in his course. But before I get into that, I'll take a step back towards what might be my argument for the day. A proposal or two, um, and these come from genre theory, which is my area of uh, specialization. The first one is a sort of methodological or analytical proposal, which is that uh, genre theory can be really helpful for helping us understand successful high impact educational practices. So when we're seeing what matters to students, what makes a difference in their learning, genre theory is going to be a useful lens for understanding that. But we'll see as I near the end of my presentation that I take the analytical or sort of methodological perspective and I switch it into a pedagogical proposal, which is that genre theory can also provide an essential pedagogical tool for achieving the aspirations of general education, particularly through writing. <clears throat> but I suppose I should actually define what I mean by genre. Right? Um, probably the most familiar uh, idea of genre that most of us are coming in with is genre as a category of text, as kind of text, right? Um, those of us um, who remember actually going to video stores can remember the racks of, you know, action and adventure, romance, comedy, you know, and that's, that's a really sort of straightforward basic understanding of genre. But in writing studies, for quite a while now, we've been operating under an alternate definition of genre as social action. And this is basically a rhetorical definition of genre. Genre, the theory goes, uh, tells us the forms that we can use, the audiences that we can address, the persona that we can take on, etc., through our writing. And so the syllabus is a really, I think, familiar kind of touchstone uh, for this. So the syllabus clearly is genre. Right? And when we go to write a syllabus, we have a sense of what that all looks like, right? Formally, we know the first page or so is going to have the course objectives, maybe the assignments, the required texts, and so forth. Then it's going to turn to the policy sheet. Uh, and then eventually we'll get on to the course schedule, right? Um, but within that uh, framework, it's also giving us ways to address our, our audience. And this is a really interesting thing. If you start analyzing broad swaths of syllabi, you start to see interesting patterns in the way that the audience is directly addressed. So <clears throat> when we're talking about things that students are required to do in order to complete the course, it's very direct. Question. You will do this. You will write three essays and drafts. You will blank, blank, blank. But when it comes to the more fun stuff, like the intellectual inquiry kind of stuff, it's we will investigate, and we will look into, and we will research. So there's this oscillation in how students and, and teachers are addressed, which also goes to show that the, the writer's role, the teacher's role, is also mediated through genre as well. <clears throat> um, so basic principles, just to kind of put a finer point on this. Uh, the genres, first of all, are dynamic. We don't necessarily need to think about genres as static entities. Uh, they're actually always caught between stability and change. There's a really nice phrase uh, for this that uh, gets thrown around. Genres are stabilized for now. But as we come across new needs, new exigencies, they change. Anybody who's recently gone through an accreditation may, and may now be required to put accreditation standards on their syllabus have seen this, right? The genre changes because now it speaks not only to the student as audience, but also to the creditors as audience as well. So we can see that dynamic change in genre in that, in that way. Um, they're situated, right? They're always adapted to specific needs. Again, that accreditation uh, example is case in point. Uh, they mediate form and content, so genres tell us the shape of a text and what to include within it. And you know, granted, these are kind of baggy things, right? There's, there's fuzzy boundaries to those. Um, genres are structured and structuring. So what this means is when we take up a genre, so when we take up a syllabus, we are perpetuating the, our understanding of what a syllabus is, but 
the existing notion of the syllabus that is out there also shapes what we have to do. So it's this mutually reinforcing thing. Anybody who's familiar with uh, Anthony Giddens' work, uh, he's a sociologist, this is a duality structure. So he's thinking uh, sort of in terms of institutions. We, we form institutions even as institutions form us. And we can think about genres also as institutions of a sort in that way. <clears throat> um, and then finally, genres are owned by communities. And in being owned by communities, they signal uh, those communities' beliefs, norms, ideologies, etc. Uh, another favorite touchstone of genre theorists in this way is the patient medical history form, um, which signals a certain belief that patients ought to be treated first and foremost as bodies, and then only secondarily as people with feelings and lives and so on and so forth. So you know, you're not going to write uh, a detailed exegesis about uh, your mother's emotional abuse on your patient medical history form. Because that would be inappropriate. You might do that in a psychiatrist's office, but you're not going to do it when you're going through your checkup uh, to try to establish what the new primary care physician. So uh, it signals that belief that bodies first. So as rhetorical genre theory has developed, there's been a whole host of uh, concepts that people have, have developed to kind of contribute to our understanding of genre. And the one I want to talk about today is ceremonials. And the larger project that I'm kind of working on with this, I'm trying to kind of recover the concept of ceremonials, um, because it's been lost a little bit in rhetorical genre theory, and I think it actually is a really useful concept that ought to retain a special place within the body of knowledge. And essentially it's a concept for uh, talking about context, but there's a lot of other concepts that also help us theorize context and genre as well, like activity systems and genre systems and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so, I should say something about the title, anyone from tennis. Anne Friedman uses uh, the tennis match as a metaphor for genre. So the basic idea is the exchange of shots is like the exchange of texts between two genres. And, and the genre is the rules for play that give those shots their meaning. So uh, the boundaries of the tennis court, uh, the role of the referee, uh, so on and so forth, those, those shots would be meaningless without those sets of rules uh, to mediate. And she says that ceremonials describe context. Now, it's the playing, as she says, the playing of, this, of the game is a ceremony which involves a great deal more than the game itself. There are the preparations, the choice of partners, occasion, and venue. There's the warm up, the toss, and at the end, the declaration of the winner and the closing down rituals. Showers, presentations, and the drink bar. And each of these moments, uh, phrases, stages, uh, or places in a ceremonial is a genre. I think a, maybe a more familiar uh, ceremonial to this audience might be uh, academic conferences. So if the core genre of an academic conference is the conference presentation, that genre gains its meaning and its import in part through the, the whole surrounding uh, ceremony of the conference. It includes things like the keynote address, plenary sessions, Q&A sessions, respondents, hall talk, even the publisher booths uh, at the, you know, the exhibit hall, all help give the weight and meaning to that central genre the presentation itself. <clears throat> so within the political science of public administration, there were several ceremonials that Professor Morrison set up. And he, he didn't use the language of ceremonials, he wasn't familiar with it, but I think, again, the concept is really useful for uh, describing uh, what it was that he actually was doing. And so there were several major assignments that tapped into uh, several overlapping ceremonials. The first major assignment uh, focused on personal reflection. And this one, I, I'm not going to talk about it so much in terms of the ceremonial, aside from maybe the familiar classroom ceremonial of setting up an assignment, talking it through, have, you know, getting an assignment sheet, having students actually write it, talk about what they wrote, so on and so forth. But the basic point here was they had to write a reflective essay on what it was like to be a student in the other major, since there were these two majors in the course. Then there was a disciplinary ceremonial. This was an in-class conference-style presentation. There was an institutional ceremonial. This was a peer assessment of writing using the essential studies rubric for written communication and the rubric for critical thinking. There was a public ceremonial. This was a political skit that was presented at the uh, departmental awards ceremony. So we've got three different ceremonials going on in this course. And through these ceremonials, students had to reflect upon the context of their learning, whether it was disciplinary, institutional, or public. Um, but they also had to enact those concepts, right? If we're thinking about genre as structuring. They also helped to structure these contexts, uh, building disciplinary, institutional, and public identities in the process. 
So I'm going to talk about the background assignment first uh, because it, it was the first thing that they did in the class and it provides, I think, an interesting lens into a lot of Professor Morris's motivation behind the course. They called the course, What Is It Like? And basically, as I indicated earlier, students in each major had to imagine what would it would be like to be a student in the other major. <clears throat> and uh, I had got any questions here, but I took them off. So uh, the basic principle there, I think, is pretty clear. Um, and as inspiration, many of you may be familiar with Thomas Nagel's What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Uh, so this is uh, you know, an essay in which Nagel uh, famously tries to consider what it must be like to be a bat, only to basically argue it's impossible, because he can only imagine it through his own subjectivity which would indicate that Professor Morrison wasn't actually interested in seeing that students could ad accurately say what it would be like to be the other major. Rather, he wanted them to be able to develop their own identity as a political scientist or as a public administrator by imagining the distinction that they that have raised with the uh, other major. <clears throat> so um, I interviewed several students as part of this project. One of them was Leslie, and she was a public administrator. And in looking at her essay, she performs the identity of a political scientist, but she does it by imagining not necessarily what they would write or so on and so forth, but rather how her own day-to-day -day routines would change um, and how her own interests would change from local policy, which is the focus of public administration in her mind, to global politics, which she sees as the focus and the mindset of a, a political scientist. So for instance, uh, in her essay, she writes, I think if I woke up as a political scientist today, I would turn on my laptop and catch up on the news from around the globe that happened while I was sleeping. Instead of checking up on the latest polls uh, for a new water treatment system or reading about new welfare regulations, I'd be compelled to find out where things were headed with the conflict in foreign country X or see who the newly elected leader of foreign country Y was. So here we can see her trying to take on that mindset of what, what would everyday life be like as a political scientist. <clears throat> And in an interview, she told me, I always kind of consider myself to be a little bit of a political scientist because I'm surrounded by political scientists all the time. We talk about the same sort of things. But as I was writing the paper, I would start writing stuff and be like, nope, that's how a public administration person sees it. So you can see her really starting to reflect upon her own learning and her own identity as a public administrator through this, uh, this distinction, this difference. Uh -huh. um, so not only did it let them start reflecting on their disciplinary learning and their disciplinary <coughs> identities, but also they started reflecting on writing and what it means to write like a political scientist or a public administrator. <clears throat> so Joy, in an interview, mentioned how different writing this essay was for her. She told me, this is very different from what I've done for Professor Morrison or for any other professor in the political science department. Usually you need 10 academic sources to support your ideas with, uh, I'm sorry, and expand your ideas and support your ideas with empirical data. For, uh, for this assignment, it was more, what do you think, what do you know? Which is just weird for me because I usually have to dig through other articles and data to support my ideas. I'm not used to just standing on my own ideas. Which is kind of a funny statement to make. But you can see her point, right? She's used to a certain way of doing research, a certain way of responding to prompts, etc. And this got her thinking about what is that usual way? So she's, again, thinking about that disciplinary identity and writing. So by providing students with an unfamiliar task, Professor Morrison forced them to reflect upon their usual approaches to writing. And as a result, they were able to articulate some genre distinctions between typical writing assignments in their field and the what is it like essay. They were able to develop a more nuanced understanding of the, uh, their own places within the disciplines as well as the way that writing helps mediate those places within the disciplines. <laughs> so that assignment was uh, very directly related to the disciplinary ceremonial, uh, which as I indicated before, was a simulated academic conference. <clears throat> so uh, Professor Morrison told me in our first interview that um, so he had done this assignment for several years now, and he had decided to institute it because, as he said, students don't appreciate that what they're actually doing with their research papers. They don't appreciate that they're connecting to a larger discipline, a larger picture, a larger conversation. He always worried that they would, they would see it as just this little thing that they had to do kind of last minute because they're busy and turn it in and then they were done with it and they never have to think, think about it anymore, uh, anymore. So what he had them do was take one of those little papers that they wrote and turn it in and never call again and break it back and look at it again and revise it and update it and turn it into a 15 minute conference style presentation. <clears throat> um, and then if we're thinking about this in terms of ceremonial, not only did the students 
uh, work on panels to present their papers, but he acted as a respondent. Uh, I'll show a little bit later that uh, what he would do is he would synthesize their papers uh, as best he could because they you know, they're often really diverse, but he tried to organize them according to common themes uh, that were common in both of the uh, fields of political science and public administration. And then there was always a Q&A session as well. So pretty clearly the conference style and ceremony. <clears throat> Uh, so just a, a quick example, I'm not so worried about content per se of these, but rather how they were executed. Uh, but Joy uh, had written a paper about the Lord's resistance armies. You might remember the Coney 2012 meme that uh, went around social media in uh, 2012. That was what it was about. She was responding to, uh, it was actually a take-home essay exam for a, a course of Professor Morrison's that asked them to talk about whether the International Criminal Court can facilitate both peace and justice and they had to take a side one way or another on that. <clears throat> so she decided to take this paper and rework it. And in terms of process or procedure, the ceremony will help her think about um, or <coughs> an approach to actually sharing it. So rather than just standing and reading a paper from beginning to end, which a lot of her peers did, she actually took it as a presentation and she converted everything into note cards and then worked from note cards. So she clearly had an awareness of the, the needs of the ceremony to get a talk, so to speak. <clears throat> um, she also revised an argument. So she told me, or so she told the class rather, uh, based on my data at the time, I didn't think that the ICC was able to administer peace and justice, but that doesn't mean that it's not important or that it doesn't do any good. Through the use of the ICC, there is visibility created through these situations where other countries can step in and it helps transparency. And she also noted uh, the fact that they tried to bring Pony to trial, but it was unsuccessful ultimately. And so, knowing that, she might have changed her argument too, um, which just goes to show that she had an awareness of how changing geopolitical events would make her change her conclusions, which is clearly something that any political scientist would recognize, right? So, she's again taking on that way of knowing that would be common in political science. <clears throat> so, Professor Morrison, who's responsible, was also really uh, important in this ceremonial as well. He told the class, this is an opportunity to take a deep breath and say, wow, this is all about power. This is all about legitimacy. This is all about institutional design. This is all about the importance of decision making. This is all about characteristics that go into good leadership. It exposes you in a new way to these big themes that you've been hearing about, but maybe didn't recognize how they fit together and didn't realize how this stuff that seems local actually is related to other things that you were doing in the world of classes. And just as a quick example, the kind of synthesis that he would do um, in the panel in which Joy presented, he, for his synthesis, he actually talked about different methodologies and ways of working with data in political science and public administration. Um, so he told the class that a public administration is uh, data driven, whereas on the political science side, you have presentations that are largely theoretically theoretical, theoretical, driven. So he's getting them again to think through what does it mean to be a member of this. And, uh, in so doing, he helped reconstitute students, not necessarily students, but as disciplinary participants. Um, and it was through his synthesis that a lot of this work happened. So you can see Joy reflecting later on in the semester in an interview. Um, during the last panel we had, I was telling myself, these are the salary. These are so different. And then at the end, the common denominator was citizen participation. And every paper touched base on how citizens participate. So she started being able to see these larger, broader themes and synthesis uh, through the course. And she told me, I think what he wants us to see is that all these papers are so different, but they do have underlying themes, and that papers we've written a long time ago can still be relevant today. But the papers professors make us write aren't just the case, they have all these themes. I think this clearly taps into the aspirations of general education, even though this is within the framework of the major, we can talk a little bit about that later. Um, to see these broad connections is exactly what we want students to be able to do. But the disciplinary ceremonial was not the only one that he set up, as I indicated. He also set up this institutional ceremony. Um, and this was through a peer assessment activity in which, again, students had to take, use the essential studies rubric to written communication and critical thinking to assess each other's writing. <clears throat> As he writes on the assignment sheet, the purpose of this assignment is twofold. First, assessing the work of your peers will have a positive impact on your own academic products. You will internalize two rubrics designed for evaluating papers in terms of critical thinking and written communication skills. Secondly, you will contribute to the ongoing assessment of undergraduate student learning within the Department of Political Science and Public Administration based on the above standard goals. Now, I highlighted the word internalize there because I think 
it indicates that he didn't just see this as a rote exercise. He actually wanted them to take on an institutional perspective or an institutional identity uh, to see things through the institutional lens and not just the disciplinary lens, to give them another view on their own learning. <clears throat> and uh, so he told, uh, he told me it allows them to gauge more or less where they are relative to their peers. That's something we think about in terms of enhancing communication, but it's not always emphasized. Sometimes we overemphasize the individual piece on its own merit. Of course, that's vitally important, but I think in terms of students' understanding of their own ability to communicate, it's really helpful for them to see other people's work. So he really believed that the activity allowed students to compare themselves and their writing to others in their major, and he hoped that a realization of their relative strengths and weaknesses would eventually allow them to continue to improve as writers, particularly as they were thinking, oh gosh, I'm about to graduate, and I see this person is a lot stronger writer than I am, that may influence my ability to get a job, maybe I need to work on things a little bit. <clears throat> so, if we're thinking about this as a, again, a ceremonial, thinking that <coughs> theoretical framework, this included uh, a norming discussion. So he actually gave them a, a sample paper, had them score using the rubric, and then used that to talk about the, what does the language of the rubric actually mean. Um, they, in the production, sharing and reading of the artifact, when they would sit down, they told me they would consult the rubric, they would assign a score, and then they would uh, justify that score explicitly, sometimes using the language from the rubric. I'll show some examples of that here in a second. <clears throat> and Professor Morrison encouraged students to take up this institutional perspective, and it positioned them as very specific kinds of readers. So, the way that the rubrics uh, work, they have like a 3, 2, 1, 0 for a score that you can assign. Uh, that's probably pretty familiar, right? And they're supposed to be treated as thresholds. So a three isn't, per uh, isn't uh, perfection, right? A three is very good beyond which might be perfection. So it's a threshold beyond which there's still more that can be done, which shows that there's there's some wiggle room between a two and a three and a one and a two and so on and so forth. And so he told this to them um, and asked the students to work as critical readers and evaluators of each other's work and to act as representatives of the institution's view of acceptable thresholds for critical thinking and written communication. <clears throat> uh, so, for example, uh, Leslie's comments on the papers that she reviewed focused on flow and on synthesis. Uh, she wrote on one of the papers, the paper was extremely well written and the ideas flowed together very well. It was easy to follow and I didn't feel like I needed to restart reading a new section to get my bearings from what I was reading. And this language, points pretty specifically to parts of the rubric that talk, talk about the ideas flowing in a logical order, as well as guidance for readers, right? that you know where the paper is going, that you're not just kind of going meandering from idea to idea. On another paper she wrote, while the paper was decently developed, the paper lacked complete synthesis. The progression from one idea to another was a bit hazy, especially towards the last half of the paper. And this points to critical thinking language about synthesis of material and again logical. Joy uh, commented on the execution of a thesis in one of hers. She said, it wasn't until the end of the paper that I realized that you were disagreeing with the article. There was no thesis or statement of what you thought of the article. And this points to language on the rubric in that one category, and this is probably pretty familiar to you, uh, maybe even as writers yourselves, I know I do this, we often find ourselves backing our way into ideas as we're writing. And a lot of times our students don't take the time to then revise and front load those ideas they come to and then build from there. And so she was seeing that happening in this paper. Uh, as the category says, writers in this category may discover a sense of purpose as they write, but they haven't revised the entire paper to reflect this new focus. They're pretty explicitly referencing the rubric and thinking about this language. And uh, as she told me in the interview, after I read those papers, I was like, whoa, I hope someone else doesn't read mine and think it doesn't make sense, or I can't follow that, or that there's no depth to the paper. So I went back to the paper, and that's when I realized that my paper was good in the sense that I had a thesis and I laid out how I was going to explain things. So I do think it was easy to follow, but there was a lack of that. My ideas were very surface. I would make my argument and connect to someone else's argument, and then I thought that was good enough. So again, she's reflecting on her own writing, this time through this institutional lens, not so much the disciplinary lens, so using the more generalized language for written communication in this case. <clears throat> so through this institutional ceremonial, he gave them uh, broad cross-disciplinary definitions of written communication and of critical thinking and gave them, again, another lens for understanding the writing and learning besides the disciplinary one that was offered in the simulated academic conferences. 
So we had the disciplinary ceremonial and the institutional ceremonial. Um, then he also set up a public ceremonial, which was uh, political skits that were performed at the Political Science and Public Administration's Department of Awards ceremony. And uh, Professor Morrison told me in an interview he had uh, an ulterior motive behind this. The, as he put it, the award ceremony had become a disastrous death march, where basically it was just a handful of faculty and the awardees were the only ones who would show up and would be like, read the name, come up, uh, read the name, come up, uh, and he wanted to make it more interesting, more exciting, get more people there, and get more fun. And so he thought, you know, let's get the capstone students to come in and do skits, live in the movie a little bit. <clears throat> but he also decided you know, that he wanted to uh, make this a rigorous assignment, not just for fun, per se. And so he asked the students to do political satires. And uh, this allowed them to connect with what Basinger calls the communicative possible, or possibilities of their time through a high status mode of discourse. He told the class, satire is part of our national dialogue, the way we communicate. I can't tell you what the percentage is, but I know it's high, the number of people that receive as a primary news source of Daily Show or the Bear Report. We start seeing it in all sorts of other ways. A political skit is an opportunity for you to make that statement, but do it with humor. So he's really trying to tap into what he saw as this high status discourse of uh, political satire. And he also saw that tapping into what I uh, sort of noted earlier was a latent general education goal of uh, citizenship or civic participation. Uh, in this case, based on uh, public discourse about and critique of the department and of current political events. It was latent because it, citizenship is not in the essential studies goals at all, and it's not actually even in the political science and public administration department's goals, uh, primarily because it's really hard to assess citizenship. How do, you, how do you evaluate somebody's citizenship? He told me he had a student once who was super committed to monarchy. Is that being a bad citizen? He was you know, well informed, it was based on political theory, he was very committed to it. You know, does that mean he gets poor evaluations if he's being assessed? I don't know. Uh, but <clears throat> um, he still wanted to get to not only to think in terms of the discipline, but, and, uh, but also to make statements about the discipline in a sort of more public setting. So um, I'll just give an overview of the presentation that Joy, Leslie, Mitchell, Armand, and Hammer gave. This was the winning skit, there were five or six of them. Um, and it was a self aware critique of the class and the department, as well as. Kind of contemporary politics. So it started off, Armand got on stage and gave a spot on impersonation of Professor Morrison. It was amazing. Um, and it was actually Professor Morrison introducing the skit assignment, the very meta, right? Um, so then he goes off stage after introducing the assignment, and then the other group members sit down and they actually simulate their own conversation trying to plan their skit. And so this involved in tossing around several ideas. Um, the, the most prominent one was, well, we can mock up a, a website for healthcare.gov that doesn't work. Because this was when healthcare.gov first came out, and it, it was a disaster, and it kept you know, bogging down, and so on and so forth. So they thought it was really funny. They are like, ah, that's too much work. Let's do this, let's do that, ah, I don't know. And eventually, the group uh, suggests to Mitchell, you should ask Professor Morrison to cancel the skits. If we all refuse to do it, you can't make us do it. And apparently this actually happened in real life, not just in skit land, where there was a mild threat of rebellion, but Professor Merrick of course said, actually, yes, I can make you do it, and I will go to the book and do it. And they said, okay, never mind. Um, so they, they included that in there. <laughs> so then eventually, um, you know, they're tossing around all these ideas. Armand comes back on the stage, asks himself this time, and sits down, realizes he's the only Democrat in the room, and the rest of the group members are all Republicans. And so he runs off the stage screaming, Ah, the conservatives too much applause and, and laughter. So that's the skit that they gave. Um, and as Joy reflected, she told me it was funny because in our skit, you did get to see Armand say, oh, am I with a bunch of conservatives? Which is funny because there are three of us that are active members of college Republicans, and he's actively in college Democrats. So it's funny because it was actually true, uh, because when we were having our first race he was like, seriously, are you all conservative? This might be a problem. <clears throat> And uh, Professor Morrison told me they got something that everyone recognized, which is the ideolo ideological division within the major. We can get along, but as soon as we find out what ideology we hold, the interpersonal dynamics were completely different. And they actually talked about this early in the semester as they were kind of reflecting on the twin majors themselves and so on and so forth. That it's really a part of the department of culture there that people tend to wear their political perspectives on their sleeves. Like, 
the bar he got. Um, and that, so that's part of the uh, dynamics there. So the group, they won, um, you know, because it was really funny and entertaining, but also because they were able to engage in critique on multiple levels. They critiqued the department and its culture, they critiqued the class and the assignment itself, uh, they satirized um, uh, political events that were occurring at the time. Uh, and they were able to use satire to do so within this larger public ceremony, giving them, again, yet another lens on their own learning and the application of their learning. So, um, <laughs> drug broadly speaking, then, through these ceremonial students, we're able to integrate personal, disciplinary, institutional, and public perspectives on their learning. And that, I think, it really speaks to, again, these broad aspirations of general education, where we want to see them integrating their learning and not thinking about it all in a piecemeal fashion. Um, and they were able to, and forced to shift perspectives often from student to disciplinary expert to evaluator to citizen. And that was a key uh, component of this. Like the ceremonials, instead of just being yet another assignment, they forced the students to take on a perspective or an identity. And that's where I think a lot of the buy in comes from. And so they helped students approach the aspirations of high impact practices and general education broadly by encouraging reflection and integration. <clears throat> So what I'm sort of arguing here is that ceremonials uh, can offer, can be really useful pedagogical tools. So this is where I'm you know, shifting into that pedagogical recommendation by way of conclusion. Um, they can help us coordinate multiple genres for students so that it's not just several kind of disconnected assignments, but rather they're integrated and contextualized for students. Um, in addition to coordinating genres, they also coordinate participants by giving them meaningful roles to play, uh, this case disciplinary institutional public. And so faculty teaching in general education courses, I think, can think about assigning a wider range of genres than just the ones that they maybe typically assign, or maybe just the ones they use as disciplinary experts. Uh, you know, show these, the institutional uh, assessment or the skits, right? Still require them to use and mold and change their disciplinary knowledge in different ways. And um, uh, again, simulated ceremonials, even in lower division courses, I argue, can promote student buy-in. That's kind of the argument, that's where I am right now. I, I can talk about other examples of this uh, that I've been working on on my own if you're interested, um, but I, I can open it up for questions or discussion. 